Welcome. And today uh, is our uh, nth meeting of the Generative AI Innovation Incubator. And today we are very excited to in, uh, invite Eric Shing, who is a faculty, um, he's actually full professor in the machine learning department and also uh, president of the only university of AI in the world. So we're, we're very excited to have him here. I, I just want to say a few words about this series of events. And um, we are working to bring together a community of people who want to be well informed about developments in generative AI as our way of of positioning ourselves as counter to the hype and fear that often floods the media. And we're doing that with uh, invited talks like the one we'll have today from Eric Shing, my distinguished colleague. Um, also panels, we've had three of them in three different areas. Uh, we're offering tutorials to people who want to get more hands-on experience with generative AI, and we have three uh, hackathons. So far, 2,700 people have registered for our events. We've had about 1,500 cumulative event participations across these events, and about 1,200 cumulative video views of the recorded sessions. You can see our past events on the events page for, the, uh, for this series of events, and many of the recordings are up, so that if you missed some, you can catch up. We have two upcoming talks. Uh, on June 30th, Manuela Veloso will come and talk about recent developments in AI and finance. She's the head of AI at JP Morgan and also a full professor in our machine learning department. And then on July 14th, Jill Lehman, who is an AI researcher, but also a speculative fiction author who writes about generative AI, will talk about the really important topic of separating truth and fiction about generative AI. Um, so here's Manuela Veloso. You can see here one of her robots that she uh, worked on developing um, as a faculty member here at CMU. And we're really excited um, to have someone of her caliber coming and giving a talk as part of our series. And then, and here's Jill Lehman, and you can see the cover of her book uh, that came out uh, recently uh, about generative AI. On July 18th, our third of three tutorials will be uh, offered, and these are completely free. And if you haven't already signed up for one and would like to get some hands-on experience with large language models being mentored by a leader in the field, Daphne Ippolito, please sign up on our website. And finally, we have three hackathons in three different uh, areas. Two of them, uh, we already are full with participants. We're still, we still have open registration though for finance and economics, and we strongly encourage participation. Um, these are, are really fun and they're, they're drawing attention from all over the world. So today we will have Eric Shing give our talk. He was on our panel for medicine and public health just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, I have already mentioned his dual um, affiliation. Um, he is a leader in many areas that are relevant for today. Um, he has two PhDs, one in artificial intelligence and the other in biology. And he brings those together in the cutting edge work in computational biology that he does. But he also does a lot of work in NLP and networks in general, and I will let him say more about his work. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, great. First of all, let me thank Caroline for the very warm invitation and introduction. Uh, I, I thought it's a great effort to put together this event for uh, educating and also uh, explaining the potential and also the concerns in generative AI. This is a big wave that we are currently experiencing. And also I feel extremely honored to be alongside with my distinguished colleagues from CMU and other places like Manwala uh, to uh, contribute to the, uh, to the topic. Uh, what I'm going to do today is to uh, uh, 
uh, represent a, a small uh, high-level informal talk that I did uh, last week at the Royal Society of UK. Um, I was actually uh, giving that talk uh, right after I visited their library and uh, you know, um, uh, saw the signature of uh, Isaac Newton and also his uh, original manuscript of the Principia, which was really awe-inspiring. And uh, that actually made me a little bit more nervous when we present because uh, what I'm gonna talk about today and that day was uh, kind of a, a opposite approach uh, toward uh, what he was trying to advocate, in, which is a uh, clean mathematically inspired and explained first principles. I felt that uh, that principle, uh, first principle driven research uh, is uh, very, very elegant and powerful, but it does not solve all the problems we need to solve. And uh, there may be opportunity or a need to look toward other angles. So that basically is the context of uh, today's talk. Uh, so the title, as you can see, is kind of a historical perspective in biological study from X-ray crystallography to alpha fold to generative AI. And I want to argue that what we're experiencing now may be the beginning of a renaissance of empiricism and the connectionism in biological research. And here is why. Yeah, so this slide is pretty much telling us that uh, we are at the age of uh, big data enabled foundation models, right? We've seen, you know, uh, you know, several orders of magnitude of uh, size increase of our models, you know, in the language space. And uh, we've already seen GPT-4 in the play. It is really powerful and uh, it is uh, drawing a lot of information and capability from uh, uh, all sorts of uh, language text information ever produced in human civilization. And uh, that kind of magnitude of data when combined with large models seems to be delivering something quite amazing to the general public. Now, uh, and uh, it, it really uh, is a type of model that is uh, very different from uh, the typical machine learning NLP and the CV research we did earlier, which is very task specific. Right? This type of uh, foundation models is very versatile. They can deliver many functions such as the ones listed here, doing translation, generating texts, um, writing even the code for you, produce some pictures and so forth. So it's intriguing to ask, what if we change the input from textual information to some other data, such as the biological data that we uh, have been collecting over the past several decades, including the genome data, the transcriptome data, the proteome data, and so forth. And then when they all together enters a foundation model, what kind of a capability you know, we may be anticipating, right? So that's actually a, a very exciting question. And people kind of see a glimpse of uh, that capability from the success of our fold already. But our fold is actually a very small model. It is not yet at the scale of uh, the large language model we're talking about. So what I'm going to talk about today is something even bigger, right? And the applications of uh, this type of effort can be very obvious. For example, uh, people have been spending a lot of effort you know, for drug discovery, which is a very, very tedious process. And uh, the process entails, you know, a, a very messy beginning starting from, uh, you know, a astronomical number of uh, compounds and options. And then you enter through a several phases of uh, filtering and the sifting based on, you know, uh, their effects, based on side effects, based on treatment effects, and also based on trial studies and so forth. And uh, after many rounds of uh, selection, you end up with maybe one compound if you're lucky. And uh, that typically will cost a 10 year period of time and maybe multiple billions of dollars, right? So this is a particular process of a doing drug discovery, but what is actually trying to uh, build on is actually to use biological knowledge starting from, uh, you know, maybe a uh, uh, sequence information like our genome and the proteome to structure information like the drug, how they look like and the, what kind of uh, structure and function they have. And then to make predictions of, you know, uh, you know, uh, cellular effects and the uh, treatment effects and so forth. So if we are a first principle driven thinker, the lower part is actually what we should have done. But why drug discovery isn't executed in such a clean and straightforward way? Well, 
I think uh, one of the reasons is because uh, we actually don't know all these principles, or maybe the principles are not adequate for us to make uh, strong enough predictions about uh, design structures and the uh, outcomes and so forth. So the question now becomes, we've got a new tool, which is uh, the foundation model, which appear to be amazing you know, in NLP and other applications. Can we expect the same for biology if we use large data? Well, that's actually a very interesting question because uh, biological research, you know, uh, you know, as you Carolyn just mentioned, I've been trained, you know, early as a biologist. You know, uh, I had some personal experience with uh, biological science, which is actually largely empirical. You do all sorts of uh, experimentations, you know, sacrifice animals, uh, making observations of uh, samples, do all sorts of experimentations, and then you derive some empirical rules, you know, from it, or maybe some uh, empirical, um, you know, uh, how should I say, hypothesis from it, which actually leaves a huge space of uh, unexplainable connectivities. For example, when we apply a medicine to you and uh, you got treated, you know, the dots are actually not connected very well that uh, through starting from the drug to you being treated or the pathways being fixed all the effects being triggered and so forth, it is not clearly known. This is very typical in biology, right? But on the other hand, if we are going back to, you know, uh, a mathematical and the physical positioning of ourselves based on first principles, the world is very different. You know, here I uh, show you uh, a cover page of a book that I read when I was uh, very young, which actually, in fact, this book was the very reason I, uh, you know, I dropped physics as an undergraduate major and entered biology to do my first PhD because, uh, you know, Schrodinger, who was a physicist, you know, had a strong belief of uh, using Newton-like first principle to explain everything, including science. So here's a quote he had in his book. How can the events in space and time which take place within the spatial boundary of a living organism be accounted for by physics and biology? Right. So he has a strong belief that even something as complex as biology can and should be explained and studied using physics and the chemistry. And that kind of idea is very powerful and beautiful. It's actually very convincing to the point that many brilliant researchers are driven into that direction. Here are some, some named Max Derbrick, who discovered the virus. And the Watson Crick, you all know him, right? He discovered, uh, they discovered the double helix structure of DNA. And Pauling actually was, uh, you know, uh, playing pivotal role in the discovery of uh, protein structures. So this is uh, a very successful train of thoughts in the philosophy of science, you know, which uh, has been very successful in other domains. For example, in here, uh, when you want to predict the celestial uh, motion, you know, uh, the motion of uh, planets and the stars and so forth, you pretty much can predict when the ellipse will happen and uh, when the tidal wave will, will come to you based on, you know, uh, computation using a few equations. And uh, along this way, people thought I can do the same for biology. And there were actually some very good success. Here, I give you a few examples. For example, when um, Mendel, you know, uh, a few hundred years ago studied the hybrid pattern of uh, uh, the, the P you know, uh, hybridization, he actually was able to extract the Mendelian law of inheritance. And then further along, you know, uh, statisticians like Fisher invented the theory of coalescence you know, to explain population of bottleneck and the bottleneck size of uh, survival traits and so forth. There are also theories about molecular evolution and phylogeny so that you can derive the ancestral pattern based on the present form of uh, uh, phenotype, you know, or genotype. And also genetic codon is another beautiful theory based on ATGC, triplet combination of ATGC, this four character, you can make predictions on the protein, you know, amino acid sequence, and then in turn predict the composition of a protein. So it's a good story. It seems to be successful until now, but not until after. It turns out that when things becoming more complicated, for example, what about uh, using the protein structure to predict their a protein sequence to predict their structure? All of a sudden, you cannot anymore apply physical laws to compute computationally and mathematically the shape of a protein. This hasn't been done. It couldn't be done. 
and then predicting phenotypes of a cell resulting from a pure mutation is even harder. Cellular dynamics, disease models, none of them actually has a mathematical model as of now, right? And the reason I think we all know it is because unlike physical world, biological world is very, very complex. There are gazillions numbers of atoms, you know, making up of our body. And then on top of atoms, you have molecules. Many molecules makes up proteins and cells and tissues and organs and organisms. You have this pyramid of uh, structures that makes up, you know, uh, our human body or any organismic body. And then, of course, the, they interact with each other. And also the perturbation of them can also create uh, additional interventions and other surprises. And then they evolve in space and time. So this mirror of uh, complexity is what is preventing the first principle approach to be truly useful, you know, in doing biological study. But nevertheless, you know, as I said, biological science or biologists are not bothered with empiricism, right? They, you know, even though there may be no mathematical laws clearly available, people still keep collecting data and doing observational science. And that's basically just a diagram of uh, the emerging tools for creating lots of, uh, you know, uh, useful biological data and measure biological systems, starting from, uh, you know, the early 50s, you know, X-ray crystallography, nuclear magnetic resonance was used to measure, you know, uh, shadows of protein structure, all the way to genomic information, expression information. And now we have a more powerful tools to measure the expression profile of genes within every single cell. We can also take a cryo EM to look at the, you know, under the, uh, you know, magical microscope directly, the structure of a protein. And also we can measure, you know, uh, many spatial, you know, patterns of uh, gene expressions and so forth. So this data has been, you know, accumulating, you know, continuously for the past several decades, even though our tools for analyzing them are still very, very primitive, right? And uh, so here's a sum up of the magnitude of this data. For example, right now we have uh, over uh, a billion entries of uh, biological sequences in the database. And there are also over 10, 000, tens of thousands of uh, protein structure being already documented and the many, many interactions and the many, many single cell behaviors and so forth. So there is a exponential you know, volume of uh, increase of data diversity, complexity, and the volume. And the tasks, you know, uh, along all this data has been also very, very messy and diverse. And here, I just to give you a few examples of the type of uh, uh, study I was involved in you know, to some degree, and also many of my colleagues in Carnegie Mellon and other places, you know, were conducting on those data. You know, I don't want to name all these uh, entries, but you can kind of see it's all very task specific and data specific. Yeah, every type of data supports a particular type of task. Say gene finding has to happen on genomic sequence, right? And uh, maybe a protein network analysis a need to basically only measure protein-protein interactions. So it is a very, very task-specific way of doing study. Now I want to put a question forward, right? Should biological system be studied at different skills, you know, in a data and task-specific fashion so that you basically study molecular structure only under the umbrella of biochemistry. You study, you know, uh, intracellular network, you know, uh, in the department of molecular biology, but uh, not at a cellular level. And you study medicine only in hospital, dealing with tissues and the patient clinical records, but forget about all the genomic information and also the pandemic and the virus information bigger than that, right? So this is what uh, we currently are experiencing. Every study in biological uh, science are kind of a siloed in a particular uh, scale in terms of the size and also in terms of the nature of the data. There isn't actually a clear reason for that. I guess the reason is because uh, uh, resource or maybe a difficulty because uh, 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 it is very, very, it is actually not known how to even put together a study that combines genomic information, which is microscopic, together with clinical information, which is uh, macroscopic, right? There isn't such a tool available. However, when you ask what kind of a question they're trying to solve, 
what kind of task they're trying to solve and output. You can see that anywhere starting from a drug design to target discovery, to clinical diagnosis, the treatment and so forth, each of them actually by definition straddles across multiple silos. It actually requires the information across the border of a different, different granularity of the biological system. So there's a internal contradiction or paradox where the problem being asked actually is much bigger than the way we study the data and the problem, right? So I want to say that maybe it is time to rethink how to study biological data. And uh, that's where I found uh, an interesting kind of uh, uh, you know, opportunity, I would say, that the large language model that we see, even though it is in language, seems to be shedding light on a new way of doing empirical study in which you want to be less picky uh, about data. You want to basically combine all the data you have in hand and just dump them into a appropriately designed large foundation model and see what happens. As we can see in ChatGPT or GPT-4, you know, they, you know, they study all the data, right? They have uh, scientific literature, uh, you know, uh, texture, you know, uh, maybe uh, written documents, conversations, you know, uh, language alignments, uh, cross lingual alignments, and all sorts of things, long, long sentences, short sentences, and they all go to the same model. And all of a sudden, uh, there are internal distillations of those information in such a way that hidden connectivities and the information flow was enabled. So that basically is something I want to put on the table to allow us study the two paths of biological research with a fresh kind of mindset, right? Let me repeat. I just went over the old school rationalism and the reductionism you know, of uh, scientific research, which is using causality, first principle, law of physics and mathematics to study everything. And this symbolism and the computationalism approach is uh, very elegant. However, it is uh, computationally very, very demanding and it's still very poor for, poorly to offer predictive and actionable understanding of, uh, you know, or maybe even intervention and capability of many biological problems, such as the one I just raised, right? disease diagnosis, drug design. Empiricism and uh, connectionism was actually uh, to some degree uh, under uh, dismissed or kind of uh, neglected in many of the so-called advanced sciences, especially in physics, because they rely on trial and error. It is very data-driven, and sometimes it is a black box prediction without knowing exactly all the reasons inside it. However, it is uh, uh, offer you actionability you know, and also empirical understanding about how things go. You know, I take aspirin, I'm going to cure, maybe cure my headache and so forth. These are empirical understanding, even though we don't know the chemistry behind it. So this approach, promotes the belief of uh, robustness and repeatability between the input and output matching. And its goal is to make robust prediction without necessarily offering complete explainability in the sense of physical and chemical causality. So it's very interesting to put these two approaches side by side and you will discover they actually are not refuting each other. They actually complement each other, right? So our classical approach used in biology still are largely based on you know, a first principle approach. They are very analytical and reductionist. So here, you know, I, I draw a, a little ellipsoid, you know, enclosing all these methods, many of which actually uh, I myself and my group uh, have been heavily you know, uh, kind of uh, developed and involved. But uh, now you know, uh, to our maybe uh, pleasure or maybe surprise, You've seen this a new wave of methods, which are based on you know you know DNN, CNN, you know uh, foundation models and so forth. So what that implies, right? So I think there is now a inevit inevitable rise of empiricism and the connectionism approach. I want to kind of uh, explain that even to biologists, this shouldn't be treated as a surprise. Okay, in fact, you know uh, many of the important biologic findings was the success combination of uh, empiricism and the connections approach. For example, the very invention of uh, vaccine. We all use vaccine, right? Especially we've just experienced a pandemic, how vaccine was discovered. Well, if you go back to the history, you will find that Pasteur, you know, who was the inventor of modern vaccination, actually 
didn't even know there is an existence of DNA. There is an existence of protein. The theory of uh, genetics, you know, DNA and protein structures was unknown, okay, in the 18th century. Yet he was able to establish a very, very robust connection of uh, vaccinating certain animal testing models versus uh, the degree of how well they be cured. And then, you know, and also how to attenuate the vaccine so that uh, you kind of reduce their toxicity, but still elicit it immune responses in human body. So all these are done through empirical experimentation. Next, you know, in embryogenesis. So here you probably, for those who are not uh, uh, familiar with biology, this is a little movie that shows in the evolution of a Drosophila or fruit fly embryo from a single cell to a roughly 1,000 cell multi-organ organism. And uh, this actually a uh, movie was not actually a real movie that uh, you just uh, uh, shoot you know, uh, alongside a particular cell evolving. They basically were generated through a very, very ad hoc empirical approach where they just uh, grow many batches you know, of uh, the Drosophila. And then for each batch, they wait for different amount of time to freeze them and take a picture. And then they connect them together. Even through that approach, we can now establish the genealogy of the entire you know, uh, cell lineage, you know, uh, in this body, every cell, you know, uh, in uh, adult uh, embryo of uh, in a, in a, in a mature embryo of the Drosophila can be traced back to you know the earlier split phase of uh, the fertilized egg and so forth. Right. So this is again an empirical study of embryogenesis, which is important for people to dissect where you know uh, abnormally defection and the diseases can arise. Right. Thirdly, you know, uh, even X-ray crystallography, which is uh, the combination of uh, molecular biology in the early 50s, leading to discovery of DNA and protein, was actually an empirical study. It's not, as I mentioned, and done by calculating chemical bonds, the minimum energy and the stable energy, you know, based on atomic uh, composition to reduce uh, to uh, predict the structure. It is actually done based on this you generate a crystal of the protein, and then you shine a X-ray you know, across you know, uh, the protein. And then that ray, you know, as occluded by the protein, will have a shadow on the other side on the screen. And then based on this shadow, you can use a, a law called Prague's law, which is just uh, you know, a deflection law of uh, atoms and of uh, electrons you know, over objects to basically reverse engineer what kind of shape this protein may have in order to generate that kind of shadows and so forth. So again, it is not a first principle approach. It is an empirical approach in reverse engineer some you know, uh, high level observations. So that's basically where I want to connect to you know, uh, classical empiricism to the modern empiricism that the way I experience now resulting from large language models. I believe there is a, a great deal of breakthrough in recent years, which really deserves our attention, right? Everybody probably know about this picture. This picture was uh, produced by a generative uh, AI system, which actually, you know, I believe wins some kind of uh, art awards in some you know, uh, competitions. But uh, not only for entertainment, you actually, people are using you know, generative models uh, to make uh, predictions of a protein structure. You know, uh, for example, using AlphaFo2, the approach is different from X-ray crystallography, but it actually, theoretically, uh, in principle, in spirit, it is close because it is not based on first principle calculation. It is based on training a very large, you know, uh, foundation model with uh, multiple layers of, uh, you know, uh, information projection and uh, extraction uh, and the uh, combination uh, to eventually leads to Credibility, you know, a uh, uh, one-shot probability of uh, new sequences. Likewise, the same technique has been used to generate, uh, you know, uh, arbitrary images like uh, what Dali E2 is doing. It actually can also help generating, you know, mathematical derivations, uh, which is quite impressive. And also, as we all know, GPT-4 recently uh, were put against people in many, you know, uh, you know, uh, non-trivial texts such as the medical bar examination, law bar examination, and other entrance examinations in high schools and in college and so forth. And they do now rather compatibly with human beings, right? So yeah, on the one hand, this is kind of scary because uh, 
uh, these are the things you know we humans should be you know very good at but now the you know, machine is taking over that's not the focus of my talk today i want to uh, kind of uh, channel this uh, concern into another dimension of thinking can we use this capability to do something that the human being are after not very good at doing such as in biology right biology is not something a human being is uh, good at doing the inference and reasoning. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't be so mysterious about protein structures and uh, gene you know, uh, structures and so forth. So lying behind the foundational technology is uh, an a, 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 a architecture known as a transformer. So let me speak a few words about that to kind of uh, uh, maybe pinpoint or review why it is uh, a new form of tool that is deserving good attention you know, in AI for science research. So transformer is actually, you know, a sequence of uh, 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 operators starting from uh, extracting attentions, you know, from raw data and then integrating attentions, you know, into interactive information and then generating embedding based on this intention, which is called encoder. And then you stack this uh, as a unit multiple times to create multiple layers of attentions and uh, embeddings and the uh, transformations and so forth until you reach to a stage where the latent representations is adequate to allow certain information distillation and uh, maybe transformation. And then you call you know a reversal of this process, which is known as the, the decoder that produce the information that you want, such as the protein structure. Right. So what makes transform transformer work are uh, a number of uh, you know very very specialized technique such as the self attention, cross attention, and the self supervision, grading, training, fine tuning, prompting, and so forth. Again, I'm not going to be reviewing the literature with you, but I just want to say that none of this approach is based on a first principle causal inference of information and their interaction. It is based on a more geometrical and a statistical operation of the data to kind of extract embeddings, you know, or manifolds from the data distribution and also uh, concentration so that this kind of information start to be connected and exchanged. And uh, there is a whole zoo of uh, transformers these days, uh, you know, coming from uh, many companies and many artifacts. And uh, of course, biology is not missing this game, right? So AlphaFold 2 is uh, one of these transformers, which is called the evil former because uh, it is uh, you know, a uh, architecture that is uh, extracting evolutionary information from a multiple sequence alignment of uh, protein sequences and also along with the structure of the proteins so that at the same time, you extract structure you know, motifs or signatures from uh, the protein, you also know you know, which part is more important based on how well they are evolutionarily preserved across animals. So the intuition is that if you have a piece of protein, which is uh, almost the same in human, in monkey, you know, uh, in animal, in, in chicken, in dogs, uh, so that they are less variant across evolution, that kind of hints the function is highly important. So I tell you one gene I know about, P53, which is uh, a gene, uncle gene, which controls, you know, uh, whether uh, you, you, you are going to have a cancerous development in a cell or not. That actually is uh, a gene highly conserved across, you know, all the sequences, right? And uh, those within the protein sequence that are conserved are called motifs, and that usually indicates a functionally important structure, right? So we extract features using, you know, multiple sequence alignment, and also you know, uh, a graphic representation of the structure. And then we use transformer to encode this. And then we call the decoder to predict a new structure given a new sequence. So the idea is pretty much similar to what is happening in large language models. Right? And uh, here, once again, the idea has been now widely practiced in multiple other biological problems. In this case, you know, my, my colleague, and in MBZI has been using a protein foundation model to design antibody structure predictions. And this is different from protein structure prediction because the antibody is actually a pair of proteins. You have the antigen and the antibody they need to bind together. Therefore, the structure has to 
you know, be predicted in coupling, right? So long story short, there is a, a big opportunity out there to now look into foundation models for biology. And the key idea and the innovation here is to look at all this data across different granularity together, okay, under a much bigger umbrella and also holistically. For example, you can imagine that you train a, a cross a model transformer based on both the protein sequence and also protein structure. We already see you know, the success of AlphaFold in predicting protein structure. But you can further uh, more add you know, interactions of large quantity. Then hopefully you can start to make a complex structure prediction. If you want to add additionally cellular behaviors in the form of uh, you know, single cell gene expressions and the perturbations and that, then you can imagine that you can make a, you know, maybe a cross modal predictions based on a particular antigen with a specific structure all the way toward what kind of a cellular outcome that they produce. For example, the cell gets killed, you know, which is uh, maybe a, a unhealthy cell, a cancer cell, as a result of a particular, you know, a protein compound, you know, gets uh, somehow uh, suppressed or killed, right? So these are the kind of prediction we want to do. And we believe that a foundation model provides the vehicle, the architecture to enable such cross-modal training and also cross-modal prediction. Another example, this is actually uh, just a zooming in of the protein model that has been already developed in our group. Also a single cell foundation model that has also been predicted. You can see we are trying to make a, a wide range of uh, predictive tasks, not just a single one. Therefore, transfer learning and the multitask learning are intrinsically embedded in this multi-model holistic foundation models of biology. So just to, uh, again, you know, uh, maybe uh, uh, provide some uh, substance and evidence, this is a panel where uh, I summarized all the recent results based on the model I just described, you know, in uh, making important biological predictions. And you can see it's actually quite impressive. It is not uh, uh, merely one model for one task. For example, the protein foundation models can be used now to make predictions on antibody structure, you know, uh, antibody antigen docking, you know, uh, you know, uh, and the aggregation, you know, thermal stability, protein yield, uh, even mutation fitness and the enzyme adaptation and so forth, because they are all crucially related to the structure of the protein. Once you have this foundation model of all proteins and all structures, somehow they can make, you know, uh, competent reasoning even though not in the form of a human uh, you know, a style, a causal inference, but they can still make very powerful empirical predictions. Right? Likewise, the single cell foundation model is also able to predict uh, you know, cellular classifications, drug responses, and uh, even the CRISPR perturbation. CRISPR is a very, very interesting recent development in biology. Right? You can basically you know, edit you know, genes to uh, remove maybe uh, unhealthy parts or insert a healthy component into a gene to kind of genetically engineer you know, a defect genome, which perturbs the cell, hopefully in a positive way and perturb the, uh, the unhealthy cell in a negative way so that they actually you know, start to uh, uh, fix you know, uh, the health conditions. Right. Again, I'm not gonna summarize all these results. I have uh, uh, a few dozen pages, you know, in starting from here, uh, uh, going through many of these uh, results, but I don't think this is uh, of your interest in this particular context, because I understand we are here talking about maybe high level uh, uh, messages and also uh, principles and, uh, uh, and the understandings, not, you know, uh, to discuss, you know, uh, technological details. But if you're interested, feel free to uh, ask me or, uh, ask for the paper uh, offline after this talk. Yeah, you can see I have all these results showing you very, very concretely and quantitatively the improvements and uh, of prediction at the state of the art level. Okay, so now uh, getting close to the conclusion, I want to again remind you the differences of uh, what I just show versus uh, what uh, scientists traditionally expected from their first principle driven research. Yeah, so what I just show is that through some machinery, okay, without uh, knowing all the physical laws, you can still make very powerful prediction. 
and a competent prediction from, for example, protein sequence to a structure, right? And you can actually train such a predictor based on many of such pairs. Again, that trained system isn't offering you any physical insight, but it does offer you the predictability. This is very different from uh, our study in physics. For example, once you collect enough information about the celestial body motion, you actually could uh, extract a law of uh, general gravitation like Newton did, right? Or if uh, you uh, study you know, or collect uh, chemical reaction information and experiments more enough, you actually, like Mendeleev did, could actually extract a periodic table out of it. What is uh, coming from our foundation model are not something this elegant, right? It is, uh, you know, a uh, foundation model, which allows you to utilize and uh, do uh, a lot of uh, uh, task-driven applications. And that's why I say this is not a first principle causal understanding. This is what I call actionable empirical understanding, right? So it means that uh, it takes, you know, uh, connects the data input to the task output in the way that the nature would have produced, even though you don't know how that happened, but uh, it does mimic what nature would produce and also in a robust, repeatable and verifiable fashion, right? But not necessarily, of course, giving you explanatory uh, explainabilities and, and other things. So this is a very interesting type of outcome because uh, uh, intellectually it is not very satisfying, but pragmatically it is also very powerful. So can we call this form of knowledge, you know, a knowledge or not? Right? That's actually something philosophically quite debatable. So for example, this is how you would be able to use a protein foundation model, right? You can actually use reinforcement learning to have a closed loop that you, you know, generate, uh, use the conditional generative model, you know, uh, to produce, uh, you know, a uh, sequence, you know, uh, outcomes, uh, structure outcomes and other things, you know, based on the generative AI principle. And then you can measure, you know, uh, their fitness, their quality using maybe a pure experimental approach, like a wet lab approach and creates uh, something that you can treat as a reward and start this uh, reinforcement learning, you know, a uh, closed loop. Right. So here is actually some examples of uh, such outcomes. It's quite magical. For example, here uh, we used our foundation model to make a prediction on uh, the antibody heavy chain design. It turns out that we can design a heavy chain of antibody with the same structure as a wild type, you know, a uh, you know, protein that is exists in nature. But if you look at a protein sequence composition, they are entirely different. Basically, somehow I produce you the same tool with different materials, right? So that's actually a very interesting thing, which uh, deserves at least biological study and maybe also deserve uh, a serious uh, applicational kind of experiment. Maybe they offer you a drug with uh, better controllability maybe, or maybe a low, better economy, right? So this is another example where even for complex antigen and the antibody complex in the design, they can also get pretty strong results. Yeah, so in conclusion, what I was showing is that using the foundation model as a, a, a actionable empirical form of knowledge, it actually enables another closed loop study, which we can call them biocomputing, right? You started from uh, you know, uh, multi-omic data and uh, you train a uh, uh, cross-modal uh, transformation uh, foundation model. And then you test the outcome using wet lab experimentation. And then you can use that experimentation to produce more data and it goes back to retrain the model and so forth. So this loop is uh, different from uh, first principle driven research, but it's still logical and uh, kind of uh, uh, closing, right? And also effective. Don't forget that there is also uh, good guarantees on rewards and on uh, investment return. For example, in training foundation models, it has been widely observed that there is a scaling law, right? Meaning that under a particular model scope, the more data you put, the more compute you use, the more parameter you use, will lead to stronger and stronger performance, in this case, measured by test loss. But more than that, not only stable law, a scaling law is at work. Also, emergence capability seems to be also possible. 
right? What is the emergent capability? It means that it is uh, uh, a uh, emergence of some capability that is, uh, 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 you know, uh, the quantitative, uh, it, it, the quantitative change in the system resulting in a qualitative change in behavior, right? So, uh, for example, we all know that in large language models, you know, uh, when when you get a model that is large enough, and when you train uh, the model on a particular type of data, you sometimes can recover zero shot capability of uh, new functions, such as a new form of uh, language knowledge in a language that is not in the training data set. Right? So this is uh, uh, some evidence that uh, we can see actually from the recent publications of uh, such emergent property. They are actually pretty universal. They appeared in Llama, in GPT-3, you know, in Palm, in many of these uh, foundation models that we see in the domain of language. So it will be exciting to speculate what would happen when we train the same type of uh, foundation model on biological data, and uh, what kind of uh, emergent ability entails in biological discoveries. Right. Okay, so to conclude, uh, I want to, again, you know, uh, 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 avoid getting entangled into the debate of uh, generative model creating existential threat for human civilization, disinformation, all that. I think there are spaces where foundation model can be a irreplaceable and very powerful rule as a new paradigm for the holistic you know, life science study, for example, or maybe for climate science. And other, right? These are the places where we human beings are not doing anything so aggressive and powerful anyway. I would uh, imagine that the foundation models and the new generative AI uh, should be given an opportunity to hopefully uh, uh, review and dig into more knowledge and understanding. So to sum up, um, first, I think you know, uh, there is a renaissance of uh, empirical biological research thanks to the recent advancement of uh, large-scale pre-trained models of foundation models. And they result in what I call the actionable empirical understanding, which is actually quite precious. This uh, new uh, paradigm uh, gives us uh, a new tool for biological research, and uh, it is uh, offering a full spectrum of uh, you know, uh, granularity for code you know, uh, to structure, to network, to phenotype, to disease, to drug response, and to populational health, you know, for making predictions and interventions and design. At this full spectrum, it's quite exciting and useful. And which is uh, not yet possible with our traditional approach. And here we seem to be having the potential of using a single holistic and unified paradigm to do so. Right? And I think it will also trigger a new wave of uh, more easy to assess, low cost and high throughput biological experimentation. Because here we're talking about doing experimentation using a digital artificial life. Basically it is a model that is giving you all what nature would potentially you know, make happen you know, through perturbation and other kind of interventions of a living system without you necessarily doing biopsy, killing animal models and so forth. You can do simulation on a model using the generative power. So in that, I feel it could be qualified as a alternative form of knowledge and understanding of life comparing to, you know, what for principle Newton's law and so forth were trying to offer. But that said, I think there is still you know, a room for connectionism approach and reduction approach to collaborate and eventually leads to a decoding of life. Because uh, with foundation models more and more practiced for more problems, the hope is that more structures and the uh, knowledges inside those models will be understood you know, uh, through many iterations of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, improvements and understanding. So I don't think we should bypass first principle or just uh, you know trivially explain you know mod you know foundation model using causality. Instead, I think uh, the two approach can meet in the midway so that we can use explainable foundation model you know uh, where the connectionism you know can you know meet with reductionism through you know thorough well guided experimentations and validations. So with that. Uh, yeah, I think it's about time to close. I'm going to stop here and I can take some questions. That's great. Thank you so much, Eric. Let's first give Eric a big hand. And there are already some questions in the chat. So I will um, just go ahead 
and call some of those out. Um, so um, there was a question, and this came up earlier, about whether there's actually enough biological data to train a foundation model, um, or um, is the data that we have limited in a way that would make the kind of science that we would do with it fundamentally limited? I mean, it's, so we're starting with this data that we have and knowledge that we have. Does that place limits on what we can do with these uh, foundation models trained with the data that we have? Yeah, a very good question. Thank you very much. You know, when I talked to colleagues, everybody was raising the question of data, but uh, it turns out that we computer scientists had a uh, drastic underestimation of the size and the richness of biological data. Fortunately, biological scientists starting decades ago already pay high attention to the maintenance and the also open sourcing of the data. Whenever they submit a science paper, a nature paper, or other journal paper, they are required to deposit their data in a centralized fashion. So there are good databases already collecting many of these uh, single cell and uh, you know, a sequence and other data. For example, the entire training data of alpha 2 is public available. You can actually download it and train yourself, right? So here, when I put a size here, which is actually a drastic underestimation of the real data there, these are actually public data. So in, in a sense, biological data is more public and more abundant than we actually understood from other domains. So I don't think data size and accessibility is a problem. Now, I want to also clarify that there is a difference between biology and the clinical science. Clinical science is talking about the patient data, clinical record, and all that. Yes, those data are also abundant, but uh, not so publicly available. But I don't think that's creating a bottleneck for now because, uh, yeah, it is a part of the full spectrum. But uh, even before you reach there, you still have a wide enough spectrum, you know, stopping at, for example, organism level, you know, uh, for you to train foundation model that is already uh, powerful enough. That's kind of my hypothesis. So that's that's interesting, and I think that um, we could spend a little bit of time reflecting on that. Um, so I, of course, am not an expert in your area of science, but in the area of education, there has been for a long time a big push to make data sets public and for uh, encouraging the use of, of data sets collected for one purpose to do additional science, which essentially is what you are uh, proposing here. However, mm -hmm. um, it's challenging actually to use data collected for one purpose that was part of a different study to answer a new scientific question because then you don't necessarily have the data that's ideal for answering your question. And some people might say, well, if it's big enough data, that's mm -hmm. less of a problem. But where do you see those issues coming into this discussion? That's that's a very interesting question. You know, all what you've been raising, you know, uh, has really uh, been the big concern. You know, from uh, the classical kind of uh, paradigm of study, which is actually the first principle thinking, because I have a specific problem. Therefore, my data need to follow the assumption in this particular study, and therefore they need to be calibrated and uh, you know processed and so on to fit into my design. For example, I use a regression model or I use uh, some kind of other things. I have a kind of a hunch that using the foundation model, you don't need to do too much of that because uh, the foundation model should have a much wider appetite of uh, eating everything, as long as they are formatted in a way that is uh, compatible with their ingestion, right? Look at the language model, for example. The amount of uh, treatment of uh, uh, text data is actually quite minimum, you know, uh, to, to the point that uh, it's about uh, stripping the, the, the formality and some of the, the typecasts and other things. It's not about, you know, really recalibrating the content. Of course, I'm talking about uh, the pre-trained foundation model. I'm not talking about uh, the distilled and aligned model because when you want to fit a particular culture context, you want to make them fair and, uh, and, uh, and emotionally uh, non-toxic, that's a different story, okay? But you can do that afterwards. The foundation model that is pre-trained, uh, in my opinion, can be less sophisticated and picky, you know, on the data quality and the data scope. Yeah, I think that we are going to be exploring those questions for a very long time in our field, um, and 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 hopefully there will be new tools coming out um, from areas of explainability that will help us to 
figure out sort of where do we draw the line between what we're trying to achieve with the foundation models and how much the fine tuning for a particular question can overcome potential limitations and what those limitations are. Along those lines, we have a question here from one of my esteemed NLP colleagues, Irina Gravich. She's asking, what is the role of expert knowledge when we use foundation models in expert domains? Someone might think that, you know, mm -hmm. I guess maybe a very naive interpretation of what you're saying is that, well, you know, these 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 models as they become available will allow people with less, less expertise to do the kind of science that is kind of more limited in accessibility now. To what extent is that true? How do we need to be trained for being future scientists? And, and how much knowledge is needed to be able to do discovery with these foundation models? Yeah, that's an excellent question. You know, uh, I, I would like to uh, position human being uh, experts uh, next to the foundation or other uh, scientific tools as a, 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 a consumer. Uh, for example, you know, uh, if you are given a microscope, then you know uh, your skill as an expert is about preparing the sample, going under the microscope, and also extract the observation from the microscope to do the next. Right. So if you view the foundation model as a kind of a digital microscope, that you prepare the data to enter the model, and then you know you define the right task, you know, for the model to uh, to uh, to deliver or to uh, to to perform. That's actually, in my opinion, the best way of using expert in knowledge. Because somehow, you know, uh, if you look at the, the Renaissance age research versus our current research, we become more and more tedious in kind of us emerging ourselves into the kind of a tedious technical details, but uh, not very often time ask smart questions or even spending enough time to think about what's the right question to frame to ask. Right. So that part actually, I think, deserves more time. I often see students spending five minutes ask a question, then another half a year just uh, you know uh, try to work out all the technicalities of addressing that question, which actually isn't uh, at least the best way of investing time. So I hope that with foundation model and in fact with the LM model, maybe you don't need to code too much. You don't need to really you know uh, derive and distill data too much, but uh, you need to really you know. Uh, be very wise and also concise on exactly what type of uh, actioning or actionable kind of uh, outcome that you want to deliver and uh, how to validate its result, how to design the right experiment to confirm the, the, the outcomes and so forth. Right? So I actually see a huge space of experts to uh, be uh, more productive you know, with the, the tool available here. Yeah, I guess what's not clear to me in your answer um, is where the humans who are running the validation studies fit along um, this, uh, you know, kind of landscape. So on the one hand, you're talking about students maybe who are early in their uh, development as scientists. Mm -hmm. Then there are the, you know, very uh, seasoned scientists who are very proud of their to see what is a good question to ask now? And also the way that uh, research communities work where there are ongoing discussions that lots of people are thinking about mm -hmm. the same kind of issue now because mm -hmm. that's sort of socially the focus and that kind of drives the science forward. If we think in terms of a kind of partnership that you're talking about where some of the questions now are being prompted by investigations of a large amount of data. They're coming out of a model it, it, to some extent. Um, it, to the extent that that sort of takes away um, the role of the human scientist to pose the questions, how do you think that's going to make senior scientists feel? Will it make their job less fun? Will they? No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, imagine that I uh, I ship you, you know, a fancy car, you know, uh, to multiple drivers. I think senior drivers will only have more joy because he knows how to tame this beast and drive crazy ways. I think you know uh, models like foundation models will be more formidable as a tool in the hands of uh, senior people because they know how to prompt it better. Right? Even in NLP, 
we already see this new business called prompt engineering, which actually is very mysterious. It's fascinating that you some you don't actually know what's all inside this uh, black box model, but you also know how to design the right question to get things out of it. If you ask the right thing, or if you ask the things in the right sequence and so forth. Well, for a science model, you know, trained on biological data, prompting is actually a unknown business because we're not using human language, right? So in that case, I think biological intuition, combinations of biological queries, and also, you know, knowledge-driven, uh, you know, uh, formulation, you know, of the prompt can actually set people apart. You know, some people who are more knowledgeable can actually be more effective in using these kind of tools. So that's kind of a, of course, I've been imagining, but I think that's something uh, would uh, be very possible to happen down the road. So I think that that synergizes very well with uh, another question that I see here in the chat. Um, and I think it touches upon issues that we already ha have to grapple with, which is what is the difference between an outlying data point that, um, that's actually noise versus um, what is something that's just more complex than we're able to understand now? The sort mm -hmm. of generative AI equivalent of that mm -hmm. is this whole idea of hallucinations that we have spoken mm -hmm. a lot about. And in this case where we have yeah. scientific questions that are being posed by these models, they may sound crazy, um, but they might be right, or they might be a hallucination. And um, as we move into areas that are more specialized, it might be more difficult to separate out what is just a hallucination from what is actually a brilliant idea. And um, so how do you think that fits into this whole partnership between um, what can come from generative AI and the role of the human scientist in discovery. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an excellent question. Uh, first of all, you know, I I think in the in the vocabulary of uh, connectionism and the empir empiricism, there's a no such thing called outlier because outlier is already based on a first principle assumption that you have a line, you have a model, and something not fitting in your model is it's an outlier. But uh, the empirical approach is data driven, therefore all data is data, unless you probably say it's a wrong data. Now, hallucination is as exactly as you said, it's a very uh, intriguing concept, right? And people uh, hallucinate, and sometimes people uh, suffer from hallucination, but sometimes they benefit from hallucination because that means that you just forget about the past and uh, start all over again and reset yourself and uh, and get drifted away in a uh, hopefully harvestable way, right? So I would say uh, here, uh, there is a possibility that uh, uh, the model itself will, in fact, I, I heard already, you know, uh, discussions about the next GPT, for example, you know, what's uh, one of the best focuses is about focusing on a way to address hallucinations. Architecturally, you actually could uh, build longer term or shorter term memory, you know, which is a data problem, which is a, with an architectural problem to actually, you know, uh, modulate hallucination. But also, you know, uh, based on, you know, uh, your own desire in terms of the uh, the memory span, you can actually, you know, uh, put the training data in a weighted fashion so that uh, they will play different roles when they actually get used into data. And also you can kick kind of set up a lifelong training program that keeps kind of uh, recycling or consuming new data and forgetting old data. So I think this is more like a operational issue that is uh, controllable. You know, uh, once uh, uh, the foundation model has a way to open itself for the users to interfere. Right now, unfortunately, you know, uh, we have only one such open AI and the, the model is behind the scene. Nobody really, you know, have a hold of it. Therefore, you feel like powerless, you know, when things is hallucinating. But uh, the trend, you know, going forward, I believe that foundation model will become either open sourced or will be more accessible. Multiple players will be in the play to uh, work on it. It will become more accessible, right? And then it basically become an option. You know, you want to be hallucinating or you prefer to be, you know, always, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, timely, you know, uh, capturing all the new informations and always being contextualized 
with the immediate past and so forth. So these are becoming the options of behavior rather than the model's uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, defects. Yeah, just as a side comment, I just want to say that to somebody who's not um, an AI person who would have just heard what you said, this whole idea of an open AI behind a wall, hallucinating, it sounds very scary. So I want to invite anyone in the audience who's freaked out by this way of describing things, which you know is really actually much more boring than it sounds, <laughs> um, to please ask questions. Um, but there is a question here um, in the chat I want to move on to, um, which is, um, the, these, uh, the foundation models, they, which use a lot of data, they have more specialization and specialty and insight into data where there's, that's more plentiful. Um, what about areas where, um, we have less data than we would like? Um, and so for example, um, uh, the question has been posed on about um, drug discovery and microgravity. Now, obviously, extremely expensive to do this science. Some of it is already happening. We know how to do this science. But of course, um, we have to be very careful uh, uh, to plan these experiments because they're expensive to do. Could we um, be able to accelerate science in these areas with these foundation models? Do they have the ability to extrapolate uh, is it safe to let them extrapolate in these areas? Would we believe what they would extrapolate given the level of data that we have? What what do you have to say about um, that specific question? Oh yeah, that that that's a, a quite a long and uh, and complex question. First of all, on the first half, uh, whether a foundation model uh, extrapolates, the answer is yes. In fact, one of the major advantage of a foundation model is its ability to do transfer learning. You already see examples of uh, multitask learning, which is a form of transfer that uh, I train generically through self-supervision. And then self-supervision is, really, is, a, is a very, very dumb idea. Basically, you just wipe out a small fraction of data and you reproduce it. And you wipe out any parts of the data and you produce it, use the rest. Once you do that enough, the hypothesis is that uh, the model itself builds up some kind of a uh, understanding and the connection between the data in its architecture and therefore you can make arbitrary predictions and that by definition is already transferred because that means there are tasks that you do not even uh, present to the model can also get a correct prediction so in that sense i think transfer learning uh, is definitely possible uh, with uh, rare data or even no data for new tasks now the second question is whether it's safe or not it's a very, very difficult question because safety itself is uh, not well defined, right? Uh, yeah, we are in the hands of uh, a model uh, whose uh, behavior, and uh, uh, especially in the extrapolation domain, is uh, not fully understood, right? And also uh, the internal uh, physics and the causality is not made explicit. That's also making you feel a little bit nervous, right? Uh, but, you know, uh, I wouldn't, uh, there are many things, in fact, you know, we don't really know. You know, this iPhone, what is inside it, I don't actually know, but I have a button to power it off. Okay, same thing, you know, for any foundation model. Yes, it is a black box, you know, for that particular task that you uh, need to do. You can always uh, stop it from doing by just, uh, you know, uh, not use the output, you know, or, you know, maybe just uh, stop the computing. Well, this sounds like a too, too, too silly and maybe too blunt, but this is actually a nature of uh, every tool we're using. Every tool actually has a power off button and it's good to have it. This is different from a large language model, which has an outlet into the social media, into the into our internet. Actually, where uh, you, you, you actually have a, a sense of losing control you know, uh, of the content being generated. Here, we're talking about foundation model as a research tool. Right, it is not automatically producing content into the social media or into anybody's space. I, in a, in a sense, regulation and uh, compliance is easier and it's more tangible, you know, uh, in using these kind of models for technical studies and scientific research. So, 
you mentioned the idea of a, a black box, um, the opaqueness of these models, even much smaller neural models have been called opaque in the past. And yet there has been a huge amount of research and focus on trying to make them more explainable, giving, mm. uh, like making them a little bit more transparent. Yeah. What do you think is most promising in this space? How close have we gotten to explainable large language models? Um, or do you think there's really a potential there? Will we always have to think of them as a little bit black boxy and mysterious? Yeah, so that comes that comes to philosophical. I'm sure I'm going to offend some people here already, right? So uh, uh, why we need explainability, right? So I often counter the question by that. Do you want to do something? If I give you the explainability in the form of a billing parameters, you know, in terms of their causal inference, do, do you really need it? Or do, can you really do anything with that, right? Sometimes it's just a... Uh, uh, automatic gravitational thinking that I deserve, I entitled the explainability, but the assumption that it is small that actually I can actually afford or I can handle it. If you know, for example, if I have a two or three parameters, I eat a pill and I get killed, cured, fine. Uh, but uh, what's in the middle? How you get cured? Do you know that molecule is entering your body and touching upon something else? Even if I give you that, you probably don't care. Not long, I don't actually even know that. In fact, uh, we live in a world that many, many things are unexplainable. unexplainable. This is just a part of that. So I, I don't take that too emotionally or differently you know, from uh, many things we deal with. Right? So in, at the end of the day, it's probably healthier to ask why you need it. What do you want to do with it? If it's only for curiosity, well, maybe you pay a price, you pay a time. Other than I say, I entitled you to give it uh, no matter what before I use it, because it's just not productive. Right, and uh, I I think this is becoming more than the science part. You know, it is uh, you know medicine biology at this point I can tell you ninety percent of the things are not known. Okay, but uh, you know we still are alive. We can still eat healthy food. We still get medicine and so forth. It's not based on experimentality. It's based on empirical finding and also repeatable experimentation. That part is uh, more actionable and uh, more even regulatable. Yeah, let me just push on that for a little bit longer. Uh, I hear I hear the position that you are taking. On the other hand, I think what I normally hear from clinical people is mm -hmm. that they're very, very hesitant to believe any anything that comes from AI that doesn't have an explanation that they can understand um, because there has been a history in AI yeah. medicine where sometimes that has gone badly. And... Um, I think we all believe that if we knew that we take this pill, we'd be cured. If we knew that and it was, you know, then we wouldn't need to understand it. But if there's a question, if I take this pill, I don't actually know if I'll be cured or it will kill me, then maybe I want to know more. So, so, so what, what is your answer to that? I mean, I heard your stance and it's clear what your stance is. It's just not clear what you would yeah. say to those people specifically. So that basically requires an open mind. Right? So in by the way, in, in fact, I was a physicist. I came out of uh, first principle way of thinking. And uh, most of my research actually had even a stronger emphasis on mathematics and the clarity and so forth. But it doesn't mean that I'm becoming dogmatic. You know, uh, for the doctors, you know, who insist on explainability, you know what? The truth is that uh, I can, as a biologist, I would push them to explain to me something that they don't even know because the biology is the foundation of medicine. When they come to a cellular genetic level, many doctors actually don't know, okay, what they observed. But, you know, then in that case, they don't push for it because they don't know it, right? So in a sense, this really becomes a behavioral and also the training issue. It's not a, a food and air and water, you know, as a necessity. It's a, maybe part of their professional training and the part of, uh, you know, uh, maybe the protocol, again, all this training and protocol are man-made. And I believe with the advancement of technology, this all will be changed. Remember the current uh, medical bar examination is based on a old germ theory of disease, which actually already is uh, obsolete, you know, uh, you know, by many kind of centuries, but it exists because it provides a, a good kind of a framework for people to get trained, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't change, right? So uh, 
I think you know the entire medical space, uh, legal practice space, and the customer service space. Yes, you know it will be impacted by you know, not 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 foundation model for biology, but foundation model for language. You know, uh, you you have a cyclopedia, you know, uh, next to every patient and individual. You have to deal with that reality. They will challenge you, and uh, your patient may know more than you do about the disease. That's very possible, right? And that in that case, you know, how can you reposition your function? And how do you actually provide effective? At the end of the day, it's about the service. It's about a psychology of pride. If you deliver the service, that is probably better and the lower cost. And that's all that matters. So in a sense, yeah, I don't have an answer for that, but I want to really emphasize the need for the right attitude. My curiosity honestly means nothing if I don't provide a service and the value to other people, right? And uh, in exchange for all the values and everything that I do, maybe I would uh, uh, go home and uh, satisfy my own curiosity a little bit. That, that's at least an attitude problem that we, we need to, it's very hard to reach to agreement, I would, I would say. So just as one follow-up again, and I invite people who disagree, uh, because I think we should have an open discussion. Please go ahead and put your questions in the chat. Um, so I think we'll, you know, I think that there there could ve very well be other. Oh, that a lot of interesting chats. Can we save those chats? It's uh, exciting to read. Oh yeah, you'll definitely get the chat. <laughs> um, we'll we'll definitely give give that to you. I think that's some of the best part of all of this. We want it to be a discussion. And mm. so here's here's a question um, that occurred to me while I was listening to your answer, and that is, I wonder if your answer is framed more in terms of the science of medicine and experimentation versus practice on the clinical side. So one of the things that I have heard um, uh, from the clinical perspective, there's a lot of information out on the web these days, WebMD, you know, uh, PubMed, you know, you can find out lots of things. And what, you know, the average American or world citizen um, comes to their doctor with more sort of preconceived ideas of what's going on with them and what treatment they want based on what they find on the web. And yeah. um, so you could see, okay, now, and now they have this new source that sort of digests it for them, helps them access things they might not have known to ask about. However, what doctors have said is what annoys them and worries them about this pattern is that patients fail to consider their comorbid conditions and how that would change what the advice is that they should take. And so if you can't get visibility into the chain uh, that led to a connection that led to some piece of insight that comes out of a model like this, how do you know that it's taking those things into consideration? when yeah. you apply it? Or would you say you actually don't even recommend that it be used at that level? And it's more at the level of let's reason about the knowledge that we have and mm. you know push the science forward. Where do you sort of fall on that? Yeah, that's, this is an excellent question. Um, I think you know uh, maybe uh, if, if we talk a little bit more rigorously and uh, philosophically, this is uh, about uh, whether we go absolutism or relativism, right? You know, everything when you push for absolutism is a dead end because uh, if you absolutely explain something or want something to the bottom, you will be pushed back, just even by God, you know, by nature, right? But uh, relativism gives you that kind of trade-off that uh, based on the reality, the resource, the time, for example, how, how urgent this patient is to be treated, how much budget you have, and also, you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, what's the relative uh, practicing ecosystem environment, all these provide a context. And then, you know, uh, it's really at the doctor and the patients, uh, you know, they, this, uh, uh, they, this, this engaging party to work out the mechanism. So I don't have an answer, but I put myself in the teacher's role, for example. I can imagine right now professors become a, even a harder job. You you can run into students, which uh, yeah, they go through wiki. Now they go through chat TV. They may know things that you don't know. I don't think uh, it's right to just tell him shut up. You know, uh, you need to listen to what I said. Pretend that you don't know anything, and I'm going to teach you from the from 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 ground up. You need to kind of uh, become uh, adjusted to uh, the fact that they actually know those already. They may know something that is not absolutely correct, but they know it uh, out of uh, whatever reason. 
And then either you convince him, you know, through your better reasoning, or you take the fact that they cannot be convinced. It's just a reality, right? So I I, I guess, uh, yeah, it, it will be very uh, unproductive, counterproductive for to uh, have a unilateral kind of position where I, as the doctor, need to have the authority over patients and uh, I dismiss them or discourage them from going to Wiki and going to ChatGPT just because uh, it makes my operation less convenient or less safe or the, doc the, the patient are putting themselves into a risk. They are all good reasons, but reality is reality. It's happening. You cannot stop that. Then let's think about how we can yeah, adjust our own behavior and the process. That, that's at least uh, as a teacher, I think about my teaching you know, a program and my own kind of uh, profession, I would take that approach to, to, to live up to this uh, evolving world. So here we're thinking about the interaction between uh, humans and this uh, these models. Um, and we have many different kinds of stakeholders. And one could argue that there are lots of different kinds of expertise that are important here. And right now, uh, so, so there, part of it is about the domain expertise, doctors with their, their training on the clinical side as opposed to patients. But there's also the idea of, of how much knowledge do you have to have about machine learning in order to get what you want out of these models? There's some discussion in the chat about how much do you have to understand about the underlying technology that that is these large language models in order to um, make the prompts effective to get the information out that you want. Um, I know that in the past when uh, I used to help teach uh, a, a course, a unit in a course that all of our uh, undergrads at CMU take um, on information literacy, and we talked about how if you know a little bit about how search engines work, you can make better queries and you can find things better. Some people are claiming that these large language models are so smart that you don't really have to know that much about how they work in order to generate good prompts. But we have some discussion um, in the audience about some people feeling that some people are better than others at formulating these prompts or even courses on prompt engineering. So where do you see the, the role of machine learning expertise in the interaction between humans and large language models to get out the best information from a scientific perspective. Oh, um, yeah, I, I think machine knowledge, of course, is useful for uh, making further innovations or push for deeper understandings of the foundation model or large scale pre-trained models. But it's about the, does everyone needs to reach that level or not, right? It's the it's market size, right? So uh, just like, you know, a microscope, I, I keep using this as an example because it's kind of a best connection of a kind of a incomprehensible data to a user that needs to do something with the data, right? So yeah, you if you really know how a microscope was made, that's very good for you because you can make some additional innovation. Some people, for example, lead a drop of oil you know, in, into that uh, particular sample. They get a additional layer of amplifying because that, because that person knows physics and knows some kind of optical reflection theory in that. But if you don't know it, you can still use it. It's just that with less return, right? Uh, I, I want to warn against uh, the thinking that everybody must be a machinery expert. And uh, it's not easy to become a machinery expert, but if you be a machinery expert, you become, you know, you, you have additional return, that's for sure. Right? But on the other hand, without being an insider in machine learning, figuring out how to do good prompting and uh, how to uh, collect good data, you know, using in ingenious design of the experimentation, uh, and uh, and also you know uh, maybe uh, utilize the outcome for you know uh, either commercially or scientifically interesting applications. They actually create larger space than before, you know, for innovation and also for profit uh, for uh, prosperity. Uh, I, I I can kind of imagine in the future, just like nowadays, we don't have too many nuclear scientists and rocket scientists because these are niche areas, you know. Uh, but you can actually you know, be the next layer of a bigger market players you know, to utilize that. So I eventually, the, in fact, the current uh, phenomenon of everybody jumping on board to AI, become an AI worker is rather abnormal if you look at the history. 
right? You know, we call a top conference, top conference a top one when it is actually also the largest of the conferences. How how come a top conference become also the largest one? Right? This is already kind of a counterintuitive. You are talking about pyramid. The top should be at the at the top, right? So what we are experiencing now is a little bit abnormal. It will be cooled down once the technology gets stabilized and there is a stable paradigm. You know, to do you know, for example, right now operating system people is very very fewer. Why? Because operating system is very stable. You know, it still has room for innovation, but not not everyone needs to do that. And also, it's very very difficult, right? So likewise, AI at this point is still in a very early stage. So it's not surprising many people want to jump into that and work on that. But let's say five years and ten years, when a paradigm like foundation model become more mature, when many many use cases are practiced and uh, start to be understood, yeah, I think uh, we don't need too many people. At least everyone. You know, working on machine learning methodology, but we need more people to figure out how to make good use of it. You know, of the the models and data. Okay, I'm just going to look for the next uh, question. Okay, so this is a very specific question. So I'm just going to read the question as is, and you um, uh, uh, may have some insight into this uh, specific issue. Um, so somebody has asked, how do we trust sequencing models like Illumina or Nanopore, knowing that they claim 99% accuracy, yet had millions of errors? How can these models be tested and confirmed? Oh, uh, that's a... a Actually, I don't know what is really a sequencing model. Uh, so I, I have to apologize. I'm not uh, able to answer to the details. I I don't think the model you're talking about is uh, a machine learning model or a foundation model. It is probably you know a data process algorithm that reads the raw sequencing experiments and then produce the ATGCs out of it. So yeah. If that's the case, I actually don't know how to answer your question because uh, it is uh, more a, a domain-specific uh, technical model produced by the 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 the, the how should I say the the, the the producer of those sequencing machines and technologies. So I also don't know these specific models, and gene sequencing is not really my area. However. I think this connects to an important issue that I am concerned about and wonder what you think about, which is um, in this space of large language models where it seems like there's a lot of opportunity. And some of that is what you've been talking about in your talk. It And especially that it paves the way for people who may be less expert to use this as a way of scaffolding their ability to make a contribution in a space. Um, then they sell that to people who have even less expertise. And how, as a consumer, should people um, listen to all this and, and make wise choices? Because the worry, I think, uh, is that you know we're going to see a huge number of products come out, things that build on the abilities that these foundation models provide. And some of that will have been done well, and some of that will have been done poorly, and it's being marketed very broadly, um, and people have to be able to make choices then uh, mm -hmm. of what they'll trust and what they won't trust. If they, you know, so you have answered a question of like, we don't have to all become AI experts, but what do we need to know in order to be wise consumers? Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, the Maybe I, I I actually don't know the answer, but I can share you my personal experience. Um, there are many recommendations, you know, uh, and people are entitled to tell you all what they want to tell you. But uh, the most important thing is that uh, if everyone, you know, uh, have the habit of think twice and exercise their own judgment, it's actually not, not that difficult. You know, uh, do you really need to buy that piece of uh, equipment or good? Do you really, really need to, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, believe in a particular recommendation. You know, we've heard stories like uh, where you follow Google Map and you drove into kind of a, a river trench and so forth. Why that happened? It's because that driver completely gave up his own soul and brain, right? So that part you cannot change. You cannot really uh, 
how should I say, you know, uh, uh, I don't know what to do with that because uh, I don't think, you know, uh, you uh, need to be that passive in front of the tools. Um, you know, look, maybe stepping back, how our body function, when body is, you know, is exposed to vac uh, virus, you know, we actually have our immune system already in, in action and developing the antibodies and developing, you know, many immune systems. That's why, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, lockdown uh, only works to a certain degree. You need to actually expose people to those viruses to get them more healthy. Same thing, when you are getting all these AI recommendations, and the uh, uh, AI generative contents and all that, as long as you put yourself as a part of uh, the decision maker, you will actually find it's uh, not that difficult, you know, to uh, avoid being carried away, you know, by many of this uh, misleading or unhealthy content. Now that's, again, it's not a recommendation, it's just a sharing of, because uh, you cannot stop it. And then I learned to survive it. <laughs> So um, a related question came up in the chat that I think is related to the role of peer review in science. And I think actually peer review works because um, as a scientific community, as I, I was saying be before, we kind of decide what are the questions of interest. And, mm -hmm. and then there's enough expertise because there are other people who are doing it to be able to judge the quality of work that comes out in a particular area. If things become less centralized like that because there are other ways that discoveries are being prompted, um, then I wonder what happens. So the specific question, um, I'll just read, um, but I see it as being of that flavor. Consider a large opaque ML model that usefully predicts something. Uh, for example, an amino sequence approaching structure. Now suppose somebody finds a way to break this into two opaque models. Um, let's see, the scroll isn't quite uh, cooperating with me here. Um, then um, this sounds like a, a reductionist success. If they find a way to kind of break this up, parts of it prompted from one model, part from another model, they're putting things together. Um, then, um, advances can come where it's not quite clear the whole path that led to that particular advance. How will, um, what do you think the receptivity of the scientific community will be to this way of making advances? And how can these advances be judged? Um, do we just have to wait until somebody takes it up and does a proper validation that we can appreciate and understand by our own old methods? Um, so does it come back down to this kind of reductionistic model that you were talking about before? Or do you see a kind of new style of peer review and um, grounding of scientific facts as we accumulate knowledge in science being developed? Yeah. For example, the kind of discovery just mentioned, I think it's definitely publication worthy, you know, uh, regardless of peer review or not. Please, you know, it's important to notice that the peer review uh, serves both as uh, a, uh, a examination of the quality of the finding, but also it's a certification and also a, a reward, a recognition uh, to kind of, uh, you know, give uh, authors the prestige and all that, right? But also publication is not only for that. Publication also has the meaning of a shared knowledge and information without uh, you know, uh, expecting any reward. I think these two coexist. Uh, for example, Shannon's uh, very famous book of uh, information theory, I don't think it's peer reviewed, okay? It's basically just uh, got written and uh, then put up as a technical report in at and And it becomes one of the most cited kind of uh, literature you know, in history, right? So that's not peer reviewed. I, I thought it's a pretty good balance. You know, uh, if uh, you really feel you have a strong finding and, uh, and uh, you, uh, you got rejected by, 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 by peer review, I don't think that's the end of the world. Thanks to the internet, thanks to archive, it actually becomes more visible now than in the past. In the past, we need to put a technical report and to get, for example, in UC Berkeley, a number from the department to put it online. I still have a few papers not actually uh, uh, accepted in peer review. 
but actually uh, get somehow published and well cited in this way. So in the future, I don't think it's possible to dramatically change the peer review system. It's flawed, but it's uh, very, very difficult to change unless there is a global consensus. So it probably will continue like we are now for some while. What's going to change and uh, hopefully you know, going for better is the economy, you know, how much you get out of, you know, a publication in Europe or in CVPR. Do you really need to publish 30 papers over there to get a tenure or to get an admission? That's something that can be changed, right? So I think the university, the industry is evolving, you know, uh, maybe toward the more productivity or more, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, uh, deeper and uh, blue sky work, or maybe create one way or the other. There is a choice over there. But uh, the peer review system itself, I highly doubt from pragmatic matter, it can be changed easily. Because I tried, okay, as a conference chair, you know, in a couple conferences, I did uh, make some proposals. Uh, and the, my personal experience is that it's almost impossible to change anything, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> People don't like to change. That's true. Um, and you also find that out when you're a department head. <laughs> um, but I think um, I love the idea that as science changes, the um, the pressure to churn out more and more papers um, might shift. And maybe we would think of what would be fewer but more impactful um, publications. I would love that if that was something that came out of this. On the other hand, I wonder if that's really consistent with our earlier discussion about um, increasing the level of, of prompted scientific questions that need to be validated. Um, wouldn't that just increase the number of studies that have to happen um, and therefore, you know, actually increase publication pr pressure? What, where do you see that going? Um. I don't know, you know, uh, I don't see it, it. Different people take it very differently. Yes, you know, uh, publication will be more and more uh, because this field hasn't shown any sign of uh, kind of uh, shrinking yet. Uh, uh, but uh, I hope that people, some people uh, will find the incentive and the, the passion to uh, uh, invest on longer term problems, you know, uh, without publication. Uh, why? Because uh, the return also can be huge, right? Uh, for example, uh, large foundation models. I think uh, now it becomes uh, more obvious than before that uh, this is uh, a uh, uh, a serious promising revenue uh, uh, venue. Uh, you know, it's like uh, you know uh, uh, going to the new continent. You know, uh, at least uh, now when round trip is made, we saw that the new continent exists, and there are some amazing results out of it. And I'm sure there will be the second fleet and the third fleet to go in there. So at the end of the day, of course, uh, the problem goes down to whether you have the right resource or how people can collaborate and collaborate collaboratively you know, uh, you know, ac accumulate, aggregate the resource. In a sense, I, I, I view this uh, recent movement as a positive uh, signal to encourage uh, our community to uh, form large collaborations and to jointly look into larger problems rather than every individually look at multiple small problems. So I think we're starting to wrap up. Uh, there's a really interesting follow-up question in the chat. And I think this will be our last question to you, Eric. Thank you so much for all of the, uh, what you have uh, given to us today. Um, but so the question here um, is, uh, building on the response to the question about how this um, how this style of of discovery could change the peer review process. Um, uh, someone pointed out that it sounds like we're moving towards something like a mechanistic interpretability uh, field in all of this, and maybe that suggests that um, there there are processes of understanding what's coming out of these models, and eventually that abstraction over the kinds of patterns that might come out. Um, from this sort of process will help us uh, as we take um, those uh, predictions and follow them up with um, validation studies and the methodology around it that, 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 that we'll work on. But a question is though, 
are we really going to get to an abstraction like this? And and do those abstractions within these mod these models actually exist? In my own experience working with large language models, especially as I have looked into large language models of code, which is a very different area from what you're talking about today, it seems like actually that that kind of abstraction and hierarchical thinking and like, you know, popping up a level from, from very complicated sequences is very challenging for the models. They actually don't do a great job of that. And, and yet the way that you seem to be envisioning the future seems to require that level of abstract thinking. Um, and it sounds like you believe that that's possible building on these foundation models. So I wonder in your own work with them um, and in, in, in this and other areas, you have seen um, the ability to kind of abstract, modularize, and um, and be able to then apply those abstractions. Do you see that as a limitation, or do you see that as something that actually is possible? Uh, what is what is your sense of where we're at with the models we have on that front? That's a great question. You know, is whether it is a limitation or it is a, a direction that uh, helps the field. Um, Philosophically, I actually believe that you know a knowledge, you know, uh, needs to be and uh, and can be abstracted, you know, through multiple layers into a form that is uh, transferable and universal. For example, you know, my lingual kind of uh, message can reach to a representation which gets to my action or visual kind of uh, you know uh, you know counterparts and so forth. Uh, at, at least, you know, I would love to believe that's the way how, you know, a nature and biology system functions, right? But whether uh, I want to make that as a prerequisite for my model, uh, I'm not going to do that. You know, I would uh, go with a more pragmatic approach that uh, I put a placeholder there. You know, in fact, uh, it's already being used like this, right? All the transformers and uh, all the multi-layer, you know, attention mechanisms uh, over problem trializations and the multiple layers is actually mechanically or operationally putting together the placeholders for what if a good transformation exists, they can capture it, right? So I would actually just uh, make that model this way to be over parameterized and then let uh, the training and, uh, and uh, the data distillation happen in a way that achieves self-supervision and self-recalability. So there is a very explicit direction that I need to self-reproduce, right? So in that case, I was hoping that maybe there will be invariance and uh, more kind of uh, uh, stable and uh, interpretable latent presentations eventually distilled at a certain level. So I'm going to study some of that. Of course, this is, uh, it's still difficult because uh, the model is too big. You actually don't know where to look. You know, maybe, maybe too many, right? So I think there are a lot of research that is unknown in terms of how to uh, gradually, you know, uh, approach these foundation models to kind of nail down some of the core environments and some of the peripheral and dependent and the covariates and all that. And that's where I think the first principle actually gives a good guidance and also the prompt engineering you know, uh, it's also a very good tool to actually start helping people peep into that. Yeah. So again, it's a combination of a very pragmatic and, uh, you know, operationalizable approach versus a kind of a first principle thinking that is uh, trying to get some something more tangible out of it. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know how to exactly formulate the balance, but I think it's at least useful to be open-minded to keep both in mind. I run into many researchers who are maybe too driven and too single-minded that they start to say no to the other approach. That's I highly discourage because I don't think it's going to be uh, giving a high reward. Well, thank you so much, Eric. I think this has been very thought-provoking. I think it's thought-provoking regardless of where we fall on the landscape um, uh, in terms of expertise or um, uh, AI positioning, you know, are we experts or are we more novice or scientific, you know, on the biology side, um, yeah. or just uh, a concerned community member, I think that you have given something for um, everyone who has come and thank you so much for your time. And now I will um, I want to say that, uh, that Karen, you are such a great moderator, you brought out so much fun in the, and, uh, and the insight. 
in discussion. I usually don't, uh, I'm not able to say too much you know, without a good prompter like you. <laughs> I think it's a good example of using a large language model with prompting, right? <laughs> so now I think I will, um, I'm just going to um, go ahead and close with a, a few um, uh, announcements. So, um, as usual, um, we like to collect responses to these um, discussions and the, oops, sorry about that. Um, and the and, and we've gotten many, many um, after each of our presentations and they help us to plan for future events and just to have an idea of what the audience is thinking. So please go ahead and submit your feedback, questions, ideas to this bit.ly Gen AI Reflect link and at the same time you have the opportunity to request to be added to our slack so that you can participate in our ongoing discussions um, a lot of discussion is going on now as people are forming teams for our hackathons and i strongly encourage those who are coming to our events to get involved um, it, relevant expertise both on the ai side and on the domain side and we have uh, three ongoing hackathons but in particular now um, we have open registration for the hackathon on finance and economics. So if, if you have an interest in that area, please come to our website and register to be part of that. We would love to have your involvement in that. And I also just want to make one more announcement for our Certificate in Computational Data, Data Science Foundations. For those of you coming who see this as a time when becoming part of the uh, technical field is something that you'd like if you have some programming background, but you'd like to actually move more into a data science area, getting more advanced with your programming skills and then learning about computational data science um, and preparing maybe for a more advanced degree in that area or just uh, getting up to a level where you um, could join um, into an IT um, data science focused position, um, please come and find out more about it at the URL that you see here, um, because we're we're uh, launching this certificate in fall. So um, see you next week. Next week, we'll have Manuela Veloso, and she'll be speaking uh, about advances using generative AI in the area of finance. And um, uh, she um, she will no doubt be uh, also raising some some good um, controversy. Um, so please come and join in. And we'll close for now. And thank you all for joining us. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>